Who are you? For the government, Sector 7. Never heard of it. Never will. Welcome back Autobots, Decepticons, and everything in between to another Transformers Theory. Today's is going to cover the rise and fall of the government organization Sector 7. However, I do want to address that I won't be covering Sector 7 from the Bumblebee movie, since that film is a reboot that takes place in an entirely separate continuity. So as a brief recap, Sector 7 was the government organization in Transformers 2007 that was responsible for handling extraterrestrial technology and threats. The group has been around for quite some time, doing its best to hide the existence of Transformers from the public. However, they would ultimately be shut down and replaced with the government organization Nest, in an effort to better cover up the existence of Transformers. But it may have been influenced by their loss of control over the situation which directly led to the fiasco that happened in Los Angeles. Since there is a lot of lore about Sector 7, I will be creating a timeline of events from its founding to termination. I will be using information that the film gives us, in addition to some of the info the tie-in movie comics and novels provide. Though the majority of the content in them are no longer canon, due to Age of Extinction and The Last Knight screwing up their timeline, I will be using significant dates from them and plausible events that I feel would logically line up within the Bayverse in order to help flesh out this timeline. So as Bumblebee once said, Let's get to it. Our timeline begins on September 7th, 1895. Captain Archibald Witwicky set out on a voyage to be one of the first to explore the Arctic Circle. He took 41 brave sailors straight into the Arctic Shelf. During the National Arctic Circle expedition, Witwicky's ship became frozen in the water. As the crew chipped the ship free, the dogs with them were attracted to a break in the ice. Upon investigating what the dogs were barking about, the ice beneath the explorers broke and the captain fell through. As he got back onto his feet, he came face to face with Megatron. But when he touched his finger, he accidentally activated Megatron's navigation system, which caused the giant robot to imprint the AllSparks location on his glasses. Now before I continue, I would like to address how I exactly got this date. During the scene where Frenzy is hacking the United States National Database, the last document he gets access to before the hard lines are cut is a New York Journal article talking about Archibald going insane. On the right side of the screen, we can see the date September 7th, 1895, is when Archibald discovered Megatron. However, there is another date the film throws around for this discovery that the majority of people take as the definitive date. That being the year 1897, during the scene where Sam is presenting his family genealogy report, he throws out the year 1897. In 1897, he took 41 brave sailors straight into the Arctic shelf. However, the reason why I take the document's date over Sam's is because it gives a full date while Sam only gave a year. And when you take into account that Sam's true motive with his project was to make a quick buck off of his grandfather's memorabilia, it calls into question exactly how much work Sam put into his project. Hence why I believe Sam's date is inaccurate. A B minus. You were hawking your great grandfather's crap in my class. So with that footnote out of the way, as a byproduct of being zapped, Archibald wound up going blind and crazy in a psych ward drawing strange symbols and ranting about an Iceman that he thought he discovered. The Transformers movie prequel comic dives a little deeper into Archibald's descent into madness. We learned that for some three months after the zap, Archibald retained a measure of sight before going fully blind, where he filled out 176 pieces of paper with strange patterns and glyphics. Our next stop on the timeline takes us to the year 1898. Courtesy of the Sector 7 and movie prequel comics which tie into each other, we learn that Archibald's babblings about a giant Iceman he discovered in the Arctic has gotten the attention of the media. However, it's also gotten the attention of then-President William McKinsley. Wanting to get to the bottom of Archibald's claims, the President dispatched Theodore Joseph Wells and Walter Simmons, a pair of scientist adventurers who specialize in uncovering bizarre creatures and phenomena around the globe, to the Boston Secure Hospital in order to investigate. While Wells was unconvinced by the story, Simmons believed that Woodwicky had seen something. In order to calm the public, the two men managed to discredit Witwicky's account of a giant Iceman by publishing that Witwicky became insane due to the rigorous voyage he spearheaded. They would also systematically discredit any crew members who thought they had seen something. The two men would also send off Archibald's glasses to his family. President McKinsley's House Committee on Military Affairs would finance and back Wells and Simmons by giving them access to unlimited funds in order to uncover the truth about this Iceman. Wells and Simmons recruited four other men, Billy North, 
Theodore Grant, Philippe Bowen, and Jack Arden to aid them in their mission. And with the help of Reginald Danco, one of the men who was present when Archibald discovered Megatron, they were able to use his navigational skills in order to find Megatron's body, confirming Archibald's wild tale about a giant Iceman. Megatron was then classified as Non-Biological Extraterrestrial 1, also known as NBE-1 for short. And according to the Ghost of Yesterday novel, in addition to the movie prequel comic, soon after this discovery, a base would be established to study the Iceman, with it being nearly completed in 1899. One year later, in 1900, Herbert Hoover and his wife Lau Hoover were in China when the Boxer Rebellion broke out. Left unable to escape the country, the pair went underground as intelligence operatives. They would end up rescuing the adventurer Theodore Joseph Wells from some rebels. Wells worked closely with the Hoovers for the remainder of the rebellion and the trio was still in China in 1902. However, when word came from America that Wells' organization had discovered a mysterious metal cube in the Colorado River, Wells brought the Hoovers back to the States with him in hopes that Herbert's mining expertise and Lau's metallurgical skills could be put to use analyzing the find. With Herbert Hoover's addition to Wells' crew, the first seven were born. And during 1902, Herbert spearheaded a new plan to redirect the river around the cube to conceal its existence from the world. And in 1913, the diversion of the Colorado River was completed, and the cube at long last was finally discovered by the first seven. Fourteen years later, in 1927, Hoover officially founded Sector 7 with the members of the first seven being the pillars of the organization. And the following year, Hoover made a successful presidential bid, using his new political power to construct a secure base around the Allspark in order to study it. That base, of course, was the Hoover Dam. In addition to this, Hoover would make Sector 7 a special access division of the United States government. Fast forward eight years to 1935, and the Hoover Dam is 100% complete. With the Allspark safely sealed inside. One year earlier in 1934, Sector 7 operatives decommissioned the Arctic base after excavating Megatron from the Arctic Circle and transporting his frozen remains to their primary facility in the Hoover Dam. According to Tom Banachek, the head of Sector 7's Advanced Research Division, Megatron had been in cryostasis since 1935. Now, in the years that followed, many modern forms of technology such as the microchip, lasers, spaceflight, and cars were all reverse engineered by studying Megatron's frozen body. Eventually, the organization learned of the AllSpark's power to bring mundane machines to life, and began a battery of experiments to test the limits of the AllSpark's capabilities. During this early period, Sector 7 became increasingly aware of Cybertronian activity on Earth, after discovering strange energy readings from various vehicles and forms of technology all across the globe. They commissioned Project Black Knife to investigate this phenomenon, and they discovered cyberglyphics inscribed on ancient ruins all across the world, raising the possibility that there may be aliens lying inert on the planet. However, this evidence was deemed inconclusive and the project ceased operation as Sector 7 switched its focus onto other classified research. In the year 1961, an alien ship crash landed on the moon. The race to retrieve the alien technology sparked the famous space race between the United States and Soviet Union. Under the orders of John F. Kennedy, Sector 7 worked with NASA to prepare a manned mission to the moon in 1969. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's exploration resulted in the discovery of several deceased NBEs, and evidence and logs retaining to the top secret mission were kept in Sector 7's custody. This top secret operation was deemed to be director-only clearance, with only the highest ranking members of the conspiracy aware of the truth behind the Apollo landings. Years later, Sector 7 discovered that the Soviets had used unmanned probes to collect samples of alien technology from the ship, one of which was the cause of a nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. Our next stop on the timeline takes us to December 25th, 2003. After six days in space, the Beagle 2 successfully deployed on Mars, and operated for a few short moments transmitting live images of the Martian surface to Earth. Then, without warning, a massive robot appeared on his camera and all transmissions ceased. Sector 7 operatives were alerted to this extraterrestrial activity on Mars, the footage was quickly seized, and Sector 7 created a cover-up story stating that the Beagle 2's parachute and airbag system failed to deploy properly, leading to the craft crash landing into the planet's surface, thus deeming the mission a failure. By this point, Seymour Simmons had climbed his way up the ranks to Special Agent. He would beg Sector 7 to continue their research into projects such as the shuttered Black Knight files. However, higher-ups in a chain of command wouldn't let him, thinking it was no more more than any rational obsession. This now takes us to the year 2007. A Sector 7 field team under Agent Simmons headed to the Witwicky residence. When evidence arose suggesting that Sam Witwicky had made contact with an NBE they had been tracking, they took Sam Witwicky and Michaela Baines into custody. 
Simmons would begin interrogating Sam and Michaela aggressively, until the field unit's convoy was ambushed by Optimus Prime and his Autobots. Jazz was able to swiftly disarm the field unit, though a backup team arrived to capture as many Autobots as they could. They were only successful in capturing the two teens in addition to Bumblebee, and they would bring him to Sector 7 and douse him with Cryoblast to keep him subdued while experiments were performed. After the Decepticons hit global communications, the United States military, thinking it was a foreign attack, began approaching potential conflict with Russia and North Korea. However, when Sector 7 realized it was the Transformers who caused the hack, President Bush ordered Tom Banachek to the Pentagon to inform Secretary of Defense John Keller about the Transformers' existence. Banachek showed Keller classified footage that was deemed beyond top secret. The footage showed that the Mars Beagle 2 rover, previously believed to be lost in descent, in fact survived its landing and had recorded 13 seconds of footage before being destroyed by a mysterious creature. Banachek then showed a comparison between the Martian and the robot that attacked Asox and base in Qatar, concluding that they were the same exoskeletal type. Later in the film, Banachek would give a tour of Sector 7, when Keller, Sam, Michaela, Maggie Madison, and Glenn Whitman were taken to see NBE-1, Banachek explained that Sam's great-great-grandfather had found him. He would tell Sam that he admired Captain Witwicky for making one of the most significant discoveries in the history of mankind. After this, Banachek would take the group to a viewing deck of the Allspark, and would explain a little bit of Sector 7's early history to the group. Banachek then took everybody to see a demonstration of the cube's power. Glenn donated his Nokia cell phone, and Simmons funneled the cube radiation into the containment box, causing the cell phone to come to life. But when it started breaking the box, Simmons was forced to unleash a massive electrical surge to kill it. After this demonstration, Starscream arrived and destroyed Sector 7's external power lines, while Frenzy sabotaged Megatron's stasis controls. With Megatron minutes away from thawing, Sam tried to convince Simmons to release Bumblebee. But Simmons was only convinced after Captain Lennox put a gun to his chest. Upon Bumblebee's release, he was taken to the Allspark, where he reformatted it, shrinking the cube down until it was a size that the humans could hold. Cube in hand, Bumblebee and a military escort fled to Los Angeles, while Megatron freed himself from his cryonic prison. Beyond providing a small amount of soldiers to assist the Ranger unit under Lennox, Sector 7 played no serious role in the Battle of Los Angeles, which was mostly decided by the Autobots. After the battle was finally over, the government wasn't too keen with Sector 7. They had done nothing but make the situation worse. All their secret weapons were ineffective against the Decepticons, and their loss of control led to the fiasco in Los Angeles. In an attempt to cover up what happened, George W. Bush ordered Sector 7 to be terminated, and the remains of the dead Decepticons disposed of in the Laurentian Abyss, in order to make sure that the United States government would never lose control over a situation like this again, the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty, better known as Nest, was born. Its personnel worked directly with the Autobots in an effort to better counter future Decepticon activity on Earth. As for what happened to Sector 7's personnel after its closure, according to Seymour Simmons, No more security clearance, no retirement, no nothing. And because of the loss of his job, Simmons resorted to helping his mother out at her deli called Cappuccio and Simmons. Unfortunately, we don't get any explanation for the other S7 personnel, but based upon what happened to Simmons, they likely had to jump into a new line of work. Now, before Sector 7 was shut down, Simmons poached S7's crown jewel, stealing as much research as he could, including the files relating to Project Black Knife, which became of interest to the Autobots and their human allies during Sam's search for the Matrix of Leadership. And you can learn more about that in my Who Were the Other Seekers video. Now, despite Sector 7's closure, Simmons kept his legacy alive. In Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, which takes place in 2009, Simmons wore a Sector 7 Speedo and used a Sector 7 portable Energon detector to locate Jetfire. In Transformers Dark of the Moon, which takes place in 2012, he still carried around his Do Whatever I Want and Get Away With It badge that he used in the 07 film, and sported some S7 branded briefcases that carried a variety of weapons. Now, Sector 7 would be formally mentioned in Transformers Dark of the Moon. Charlotte Meary explained the role Sector 7 had played in the moon landing to the Autobots. As we know, this top-secret operation was deemed to be director-only clearance at Sector 7, which, fun fact, means that Banachek knew this information during the 2007 film. Now, you may be wondering how Mirren got access to this classified information if Sector 7 was terminated. Well, as we know, Bush did terminate Sector 7, shutting down all future operations. However, it appears that the organization in some capacity was still around during the events of Dark of the Moon, only acting as a treasury of information of sorts where alien research could be stored and accessed. 
This can be proven since Mearing was able to get the real story behind the moon landing directly from Sector 7. You lied to us. Everything humans know of our planet, we were told had all been shared. So why was this found in human possession? We were in the dark on this also. It was director-only clearance at Sector 7 until now. In addition to this, the O'Reilly Factor was able to obtain documents that showed Simmons was fired by the Intelligence Committee, in addition to psych evaluation reports showing that Simmons suffered from severe delusional tendencies. When defending himself from these claims, Simmons responded with this. Here at the Factor, we have obtained documents that show you Downsize bill budget cuts. So with that said, S7 in some capacity was still around after its termination, but as a result of it being played with budget cuts and being downsized, it was forced to fire the bulk of its personnel and act as an alien archive for the government. Now, as to why the truth about the moon landing was no longer deemed director-only clearance, it's likely it had to do something with Mearing wanting to figure out how the fuel rod ended up in Ukraine. And since she's the director of national intelligence, I'm sure she was easily able to pull a few strings in order to get the information she needed, with her eventually being able to lower the clearance needed so she could relay the info to the Autobots and NES personnel. Now, the last thing I want to cover is the vehicles, gear, and technology Sector 7 used. When trying to capture NBEs, Sector 7 would chase them down using Eurocopter EC-130s and Eurocopter EC-120 Colibris. M92 harpoon guns would be mounted onto these choppers. They were an essential weapon developed by Sector 7, featuring an armor-piercing projectile that weighs 21.2 kilograms. The weapon has a range of 55 meters with a muzzle velocity of 324 meters per second. However, for ground operations, Sector 7 used assault buggies which were heavily modified Chanov Desert Patrol vehicles. This all-purpose high-speed recon attack vehicle can be fitted with Sector 7 specially developed weapons, ranging from cryo-freezing cannons, though this required cryo tanks to be installed in the rear compartment, to belt-fed automatic grenade launchers capable of firing armor-piercing sabled rounds. As for operations within urban and suburban zones or for human targets, Sector 7 agents traveled in custom black GMC Yukons. However, they don't hold up well when being lifted by large NBEs, nor can they withstand electromagnetic pulses. Now for some firearms Sector 7 agents used, MP5A3s and MP5KA4s were a common choice, in addition to UMP45s. But when the going gets tough, special agents weren't afraid to wield G36Cs, G36Ks, SG552s, M32 MGLs, and 37mm grenade launchers. Furthermore, in Dark of the Moon, inside of Simmons' briefcase we can see two Glock 17s and a Walter PPKS. In addition to some brass knuckles, to the right we can see what looks like two projectile weapons. Lastly, as for some Tech Sector 7 used, Cryo-freezing cannons were essential, since they could immobilize and freeze Cybertronians. They also would use isotope readers in order to test objects that might have been contaminated by Cybertronians. And lastly, portable energon detectors were essential since they could be used to test if an object was a transformer. And just like that, now you know the story of Sector 7. If you made it this far into the video, you must really like Transformers. And I wouldn't be far off to say that you're likely interested in robotics and AI. If so, you might find today's sponsor Brilliant of interest to you. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform that's goal is to teach you STEM in a completely new and fun way. I was blown away by actually how interactive the lessons were. In the order logic lesson I did, there were these little robot dudes I had to help out, and they all had unique animations to them which made solving the problem even more fun. Brilliant is amazing since you can constantly learn something new and do it at the speed you're most comfortable with, and with the mobile app you can learn on the go anytime you want. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash trans theories, or click the link in the description below, and the first 200 of you will get get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So with that said, I want to say thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you have not already, check out the Fixing Transformers playlist for some more awesome theories. But before I go, I want to say thank you to all my Patreons and channel members for supporting the channel. Without you guys, Trans Theories would not be where it is today, so a big fat thank you to all of you. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving a like rating because it it does help the channel a lot. With that said, hit that outro.